we are beginning a new series entitled Why Family? Uh, the family experience continues to change. The nuclear family of 20th century America is no longer the assumed standard of family. And this series isn't going to either grieve or celebrate that. Um, it, it's just an is. Um, rather, what we want to do in this series is ask, what is the purpose of things like family and marriage and parenting, regardless of what our particular family may look like? And in this series, Why Family, there are two questions we want to keep in front of us. Um, one is, what does the Bible have to say about my family? And then uh, second, what are some biblical family implications for the church? Because the Bible often uses family language to describe the church. We are brothers and sisters. God is our father. The church is the bride of Christ. Um, and as we think about what the Bible says um, to our families, we want to apply some of those things to TFRC as well. The scripture this morning comes from Genesis 45. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Uh, Genesis, it's the first book um, in the Bible, uh, again, chapter 45. And this takes place, what this is going to be an account of, it's towards the end of the Joseph story. Now, in the Bible, there are two Josephs. There's a New Testament Joseph, um, who is the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's not the Joseph uh, we are looking at here. This is the Old Testament Joseph, the one some of you know of with the guy with the coat of many colors. Um, our scripture reader this morning is Peter Vandenbosch. And so, Peter, if you can make your way on up to the podium. As he does, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand and face the center of the room. And we read from the center of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And we stand because we believe this is the word of God. And so, Peter, whenever you are ready, please read from Genesis 45, beginning in verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. And, uh, then Joseph could no longer control himself and before his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not distress and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it is to save lives that God has sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God said, sent me ahead of you to reserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of the entire, lord of his entire household and ruler of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You, sh you shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me and your children, and your grandchildren, and your flocks and herds, all that you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about the honor all the honor according, accorded to me in G Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and Benjamin embraced him weepingly, weeping and he kissed all his brothers and went over them, wept over them. After, the, after his brothers talked, afterwards his brothers talked with him. Peter, thank you very much. You may be seated. Um, families, families are fascinating. On the one hand, 
Um, nothing has the potential to do us good like our families. Um, and all these following quotes about family, uh, they ring true. Quotes like, the family is the first essential cell of human society. Or, the family is one of nature's masterpieces. Or, a happy family is but an earlier heaven. Or, in every conceivable manner, the family is a link to our past and a bridge to our future. Families can be great. Weren't those nice quotes about family? Really nice. On the other hand, families can be not so great. Um, nothing has the potential to do us harm like our families. And um, all of these following quotes can also ring true when it comes to family. Uh, quotes like, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Uh, the other night, I ate, a real ni I ate at a real nice family restaurant. Every table had an argument going. Um, my family is temperamental, half temper, half mental. <laughs> Insanity is hereditary. You get it from your kids. Um, who's it all? Oh, come on, whatever. Uh, families, they are fascinating. Uh, we can love them, we can hate them, and we can do both at the same time. And the Bible shares some fundamental truths about our families. Um, families impact our deepest inner being. If you go back to the very first two verses of the passage, where it says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. What was Joseph so emotional about? It was about his family. He hadn't seen his brothers in 13 years. And the reason why he hadn't seen him for that long was because his brothers sold him into slavery without their father knowing. And Joseph was taken to the land of Egypt. And he rose from being a prisoner to second in command in the land of Egypt. And Egypt was the superpower of its day. And so Joseph was the second most powerful man in the world. He was successful. He was powerful. He could have anything. And yet seeing his brothers and being able to reconcile with them made him cry like a baby. Despite all of his success and achievement, his family still impacted him in a deep way. We don't always realize the power our families have on us, the effect our families have on us, for better or for worse, follows us our entire lives. Some of us have good families, some of us have bad families, most of us, that's a mixture of both. But good or bad, we continue to be influenced by our families. And you can walk away from your family but the impact your family has made will follow you wherever you go. Now, as I said earlier, I want to apply some of the things the Bible has to say about our families to our church family. There are church family implications to all this. And so the first church family implication is that church impacts our faith on the deepest level. Um, I run into this often. It is common for people to think, you know, I just need Jesus, I don't need the church. Well, faith in Jesus doesn't work that way. All of us have good and bad experiences with the church, and it's the bad experiences that make us want to leave. Um, but both the good and bad experiences impact our faith, and we will never be able to separate our faith in Jesus from the church. It just isn't possible. You can try. But faith is designed to be a communal experience. 
Ephesians 4 says, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The whole body is joined and held together. The whole body grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. The church impact on our faith is on the deepest level. And families impact our deepest inner being. And families, families are infused with dysfunction. They are infused with dysfunction. Going back to the passage, go to verse 3, where it says, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Now, Joseph's father was Jacob. Jacob would be renamed Israel, where the nation of Israel gets its name. And Israel, the nation of Israel, at one time had 12 tribes. And Jacob's sons would be the source of the names of those tribes. This is the family that God had chosen as his people. And they were a big, hot mess. They were a big, hot mess. Joseph's family was filled with favoritism. And the favoritism begins with Jacob and his wives before any sons even appear on the scene. See, Jacob wanted to marry Rachel. But Jacob's father-in-law tricked him into marrying his daughter, Leah. He married Leah first because he got tricked. And then he married Rachel. And Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. Now, in the ancient world, having children, especially sons, is a big deal. And so Jacob loved Rachel more and Leah less. And God sees this. And so God gives Leah children, which kind of evens things out since Rachel is favored. Okay, Rachel's favored, but Leah's got the kids. Okay, things are even. But Rachel decides to give her servant Bilhah to have children for her because Rachel wasn't having any kids. So she gives her servant to have kids on her behalf to try to get things back in her favor. Well, Leah sees this and decides, hey, two can play that game and gives her servant Zilpah to have children on her behalf. And then Rachel finally has children, Joseph and Benjamin. And Jacob has a total of 12 sons. But tragedy strikes when Rachel dies in childbirth with Benjamin. So Joseph is the favorite son. Why? Because he is the firstborn of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. It's a mess. And then there's all this jealousy. You can read about that in the first eight verses of Genesis 37. Joseph, in the pecking order, was son number 11. He had 10 older brothers. But Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And so he gives him this fancy robe, a coat of many colors. And that was an announcement when he gave him that coat. Joseph is my favorite Joseph is my number one son. So his older brothers hated him for it. And then there's a time when Joseph uh, goes, checks on his brothers and gives a bad report about his brothers. And then there's a time that Joseph has these dreams about how he's going to rule over his brothers. And he tells his brothers about those dreams and their jealousy for their brother Joseph intensifies. And finally, it leads to betrayal, where later in Genesis 37, uh, the brothers are grazing their father's flocks, and Joseph is again sent to check on his brothers. And when the brothers see him, they decide to throw him in a pit 
And then they talk about killing him and they decide to sell him into slavery. And so they sell him uh, to some traders who take him to Egypt. And then they go back and tell their dad, Jacob, that Joseph was killed by a wild animal and they show him the coat of many colors covered in blood. And Joseph is 17 years old when he's sold into slavery. This is the family God picks to be God's chosen people. The family has all sorts of dysfunction. And the truth is, all families have dysfunction. We would all like to have healthy families. We don't. Some of us have dysfunctional goofiness. Some of us have dysfunctional trauma. And while it's tempting to think that other families are normal, they aren't, okay? You can look around at all the normal families in this room and don't say this out loud, just say it in your head. They're not as normal as they look. They're not as normal as they look, okay? Um, every family has dysfunction. It comes with the territory. Now the church family implication is that the church is infused with dysfunctional people too. People think church is the place where all the healthy people are. Look, I'm your pastor, I love you. It's not true, okay, it's not true. We are all infused with dysfunction. First John chapter one says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. None of us have it all together and we may try to look like we have it all together, we don't. Um, for most of us, this really isn't a scoop. We knew this. Um, however, sometimes we work so hard to look like we have it all together that sometimes we forget we don't and neither does anyone else. Families are infused with dysfunction. But here is the really good news. God uses our family dysfunction. He utilizes it. Go back to the passage, verse 6. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. Because of the favoritism, because of the jealousy, because of the betrayal, Joseph was in the right place at the right time to be used by God to save them all. This is the family that struggles with favoritism. They have favorites. They all want to be the favorite. They're jealous of the favorite. They will be ruthless to become the favorite. And God looks at that and he says, you all want to be the favorite. I can work with that. I'll claim you as my people. Now just think this through for a little bit. This family struggles with wanting to be the favorite, with favoritism. How do you think such a family would respond to an offer to be God's chosen? I would assume in their sinfulness, they would say, that sounds good. Let's do that. We all want to be the favorite. God is inviting us to be his people. Let's be God's people. So they say, that sounds good, God. And God says, good, you are now my people. Now let me explain how this is gonna work. It's good news, folks. God uses our dysfunction. For many of us, our families gave love and support and wisdom, things that have benefited us our whole lives. And God used those things to form our character. For many of us, our families had some kind of dysfunction and God used whatever that particular dysfunction was for us to form our character too. Both the gifts and the goofiness of our families have formed us. And God used it all to make us into the people we are 
today. He's kind of amazing that way. He doesn't just need the good. God can work with the bad. Now, for those of us who've experienced trauma because of our families, and I'm, sh I'm sure if you told me of the traumatic experiences that you've had, it would break my heart. And I would never, ever wish trauma on anyone. But God has used your trauma to form you too. God redeems it all. And the church family implication is that God will utilize any dysfunction at TFRC. Um, we are in, location-wise, our campus is in an ideal location when it comes to um, where we are in, in Twin Falls. You know, 93 is right here. The whole town is growing out around us. Um, we couldn't be in a much more strategic location than we are right now. Wasn't that great foresight on the part of the TFRC leadership in the 1980s to pick this location, having the foresight that the town would grow out here, 93 would be right there? I would love to tell you that was the case. And we had great leadership back in the 80s, but it, technically it wasn't necessarily great foresight. Um, in the 1980s, we were, our location, our campus was down by the library. Who remembers that? I have my hand raised now because I remember that. I just know it's true. Okay, all right. We used to be down by the library. But the problem was a lot of our people who attended lived far, far, far out of town. And there was this tension about how far people had to come uh, all the way downtown by the library to come to church. And um, it wasn't like a big fight or anything, but it, was, it caused a little bit of tension that we needed to um, pick a more central location for everyone. And so we picked this location in part because it was middle ground for people coming to church. It was a more centralized location. And God used that tension to bring us here, which today is an ideal location in ways never imagined. 1 Corinthians 1 says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God uses TFRC giftedness to bless the world, and God will use TFRC goofiness to bless the world. God utilizes our family dysfunction. And family is the intention of God's salvation. If you go back to the passage one last time, go to verse 11, where it says, I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Jumping down to verse 13. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen. And bring my father down here quickly. And then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, afterward his brothers talked with him. When Joseph was 17, his brothers betrayed him, sold him into slavery. And now at age 30, Joseph says to his brothers, I will provide for you. And there are hugs and kisses, and he weeps over his brothers. And Joseph loved his brothers even after they betrayed him. Why? Because they were family. That's it. They were family. How many times... Do we find ourselves doing something for family simply because they're family? My daughter is in Southern California going to college, and we have family down there. And my brother who lives down there had an extra car. Nothing fancy, but it works, and it's good for her to get around. And so he gave it to my daughter to use while she's down there, so we didn't have to take a car down there. Now, why did he do that? Because I'm a great older brother? No, I used to call him Matt the Brat. That was a horrible older brother, okay? He gave her the car because she's family. God is a God of unconditional love, and families provide a space for people to love one another unconditionally. 
Family-like relationships are the intention of God's salvation. God is all about unconditional love. I'm going to uh, invite us to a time of prayer. And uh, what I would like you to do is pray for your family. Now, if you're here all by yourself, that's okay. Um, You can sit and pray alone for your family. But if you happen to be here with some family, what I really want you to do is gather together as a family and pray for your family. Whatever it is that your family needs prayer for. Maybe it's a health need. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's some kind of relational issue. Maybe there's even a broken relationship uh, in the family. You might be on great terms with your family. You may not be speaking to your family. But regardless, pray for them because they're family. Okay, so let's take a few minutes. Uh, If you're alone, you can pray alone. If you're with here with family, uh, pray with them. But just take two, three, four minutes, and let's just be praying for our families. Go ahead. And Lord, we once again, I lift up each one of these uh, families that are being prayed for. And Lord, I would ask that you would uh, meet whatever needs uh, that they have. And Lord, that you would bless each family represented in this room. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And there is a church family implication to all this, and that is that God is making TFRC into a family. Uh, Jesus died so that we could be brothers and sisters in him, which means we all bring gifts to the table and we all bring goofiness (laughs) to the table. And being family isn't always the easiest, but we have a deep impact on each other's faith. As it says in 2 Corinthians 6, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Families are what they are. There's a lot of good things about our families. Our families have a lot of flaws as well. And they are the source of both comfort and pain. But for better or worse, it's your family. Formed who you are, both the good and the bad. And so embrace the good and do your best to reconcile the bad, knowing that God is using both to bring his kingdom into our lives. Please pray with me. And Lord, that is my prayer, that you would help all of us embrace the good of our families. And Lord, help all of us reconcile the bad of our families. And Lord, just help us to continue to trust in you that um, through both the bad and the good, you are forming us into uh, the people that you always intended us to be. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.